Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I am Kevin McCall, and I am out here today at Lynx Brutality 2023 in Slovenia, put on by Polinar Tactical. It is looking like it is going to be a fantastic match this year, so I want to give you a quick rundown before we start on the equipment that I'm using. So, previously I've always done this fairly high-speed drag, or with that sort of equipment. This year, Varsteleka has released a low-visibility plate carrier, their LVPC, Intended, well, it was originally developed uh, for like Finnish special intervention police who needed something concealable. So I figured this would be a fun opportunity to run in open version but still wearing armor. So I have some fairly thick armor plates in this thing. It's kind of intended for a little bit thinner, lower profile plates. But we've got full on plates in it with everything else. And while I look a bit chunky with it, easily concealable under an outer jacket. So I have that. I have no pouches on it because the cummerbund has elastic mag pouches here in the cummerbund. So I'm carrying all of my ammunition in the side cummerbund. For guns, for a pistol, I'm using an RX Delta with a uh, Holosun on it. Uh, both of these guns, rather than being mine, I'm borrowing them from local. So a Slovenian match with all Slovenian guns. I did, a, did this match with a Delta last year did really well with it. They're really remarkably inexpensive guns that perform way above their price point. I really like these. And then, last year, I got the chance to see the Tank Arms Varun X16. I did a full video on it last year, which you can check out if you're interested. But this year, I wanted to actually run the thing. So, we have sort of a mid-length barrel, a it's a 12 and a half inch barrel, with a little dinky second steel can on it. Again, Holosun is an option. Red dot only, so I don't have a magnifier this year. We'll see if that helps me or hurts me, but it's a fun, uh, this should be a fun paired pairing with a low visibility kind of thing of, you know, go stealth and then wabba, you've got a gun. So let's jump right into stage number one. We've got 10 total, by the way. We're going to do five today and five tomorrow. Let's go. There are lots of match directors who've come up with the idea of having you crawl under fake barbed wire, and occasionally places like Finnish Brutality will just use right. real barbed wire. Giga got the awesome idea to use electrified horse fencing, and so this is, in fact, electrified horse fencing that you get to crawl under, uh, complete with little danglers there, three sets of them. So the deal here is you have a 15 kilo bag that you have to drag under the fencing with you, and then uh, engage some rifle targets. My head is completely out of this. You'll notice I brilliantly opt not to put in a magazine before I start shooting. And then I realize that, yeah, that like ammunition makes this work better. Um, I'm gonna make a, a number of mistakes, just like stupid procedural mistakes here in this stage, because I don't know if it was pre-match jitters or what, but yeah, there, there I run the wrong direction around the thing. Uh, the battery for the wire is over in that corner. You can see it right there on the ground. So they didn't want people running across or around that. I actually, so my head uh, scrapes the wire there. These are actually set on sort of a pulsing um, algorithm, I guess. So every touch doesn't necessarily get you zapped. But as long as you're careful, it's really not a problem to stay under that. The, the wire's high enough that you don't have to hit it. But if you decide that you just want to go fast and get the best possible time, you can blow straight through it and just take the shocks, which was really, frankly, uh, entertaining to watch people do. Because everyone assumed that like these are going to be fairly minor, you know, whatever. It's a little, a little zap or something. And no, actually, they were... They were pretty significant shocks. Uh, people, you, you could tell when people got zapped that uh, they knew, in fact, that they had been zapped. So I took this uh, slow and careful because I didn't want to get zapped. And I didn't actually get any any electrical charges from it, but a, a bunch of people running the stage did. So now, yeah, now I make another mistake, like, oh, wait, do I do another round of rifle or do I go to pistol? It is, in fact, another round of rifle. There are uh, six or seven, I think six poppers out there, and you have to hit each one of them just once uh, from the stick. Rifle and or body have to be in, in contact with the stick there. That's the end of the rifle section. I, again, tried to run the wrong way. Like, my head just was not in this stage. 
Then finally come to the last position where there is a rack of five pistol plates. Engage those and you're done. The interesting here, thing here for me was my Holosun was actually, the dot was turned off when I drew the pistol and I very deliberately know that I turned it on when I started the stage. I think because I'm left-handed the buttons were outward and exposed and I think I actually managed to turn it off while crawling. So 20th of 53, 42nd overall, not a great stage. Not certainly not my best, but not my worst either. I did finish it under par, and that's that's always a good thing. All right, stage two, the uh, the Casarda drill, named here the backbreaker. I really enjoy this stage. So uh, the I, th this one's slightly different than normal. There's almost always a twist to them. So in this one. We're going to throw the kettlebell all the way down. Then you have to make a mandatory shot where you drop the magazine and you have one round to make a hit. If you don't make the hit, it's a penalty, uh, or making the hit is a bonus, I can't remember which. Then you have to pick up the kettlebell, run all the way back to the start position, and make two more hits. So that's, that's what makes it a little bit different than normal. This was supposed to actually be a 36-pound kettlebell, which is 80 pounds, but during the, the pre-match, uh, the staff match, People had a lot of trouble with that heavier kettlebell, so they dropped it down to only a 24 kilo kettlebell. Our targets were at about 150 meters to begin, uh, which then drops to about 100 meters by the end. Here you can see where there's a little bit of grass. This is the low point in the range, which is why water pools there and there's a little bit of grass. And from there, if you were really low prone, you actually had trouble seeing the targets over the, the rise in the ground. So. I decided to rest the magazine here on top of the kettlebell, which worked fairly well. Um, it's a little bit more awkward than having a lower position, but it ensured that I had plenty of clearance uh, to get to the targets. I did really well on this stage. So uh, that is my last throw that I have to make. That's pretty cool. So there's my, uh, see, there's my couple of hits. Okay, I'll get them here in a minute. Now, pull the magazine. I have one shot to make a hit, which I successfully make. Now, and the, the reason that you do that is now we absolutely 100% know the rifle is unloaded and the 180 degree rule of uh, muzzle safety does not apply because there can only be one round in the chamber and I've just fired it. So now I have to carry the kettlebell back to the beginning of the stage, replace it in the tire and make two more hits. Go ahead and reload the same magazine I had. I just stuffed it in the front of my plate carrier. Now, two hits, bing, boom. I like these. I, I, frankly, I probably like this sort of stage because I'm really good at it. I took first in open and second overall in the match here, which is uh, frankly surprising. I didn't think I did quite that well at it, but it's a fun one. All right, last year we had the, uh, the rope as well, the rappelling rope here uh, at the Lynx Pro Center. And uh, you can't not have a stage with the rappelling rope. So uh, I am using relatively lightweight gloves, so I went relatively slowly down that rope because I didn't want to, as the name implies, actually burn my hands up. So from here, you have to put two shots on a paper target from each of the marked positions in the VTAC barricade. The first three are pretty easy, especially because people kind of destroyed that third one, so you don't actually have to tilt the rifle over. But this last one is the very low port. So I made sure to roll over so the ejection port was facing upward, so that I wasn't going to get uh, spent round bouncing back into the chamber and jamming the gun. Uh, then you have to get a couple of hits on a relatively small, relatively distant pistol plate. And then we reset by taking two ammo cans. Those are completely filled to the top with rocks, so they're nice and heavy. You have to run them up the stairs in the repelling tower, which Jan, the cameraman here, uh, by the way, big thanks to Jan from Poland Air Tactical for filming me. Uh, he does not follow me all the way up the tower. So I leave the two ammo cans at the top, go back down the rope, and I repeat this process uh, for three sets of shooting and two sets of ammo cans taken up. I decided here, since the rifle's already on the ground, I might as well just start on the lowest position and then almost fall over. But this is the core uh, principle here is how fast can you acquire a sight picture? Because the target's fairly easy. It's, it's the, the paper target there is relatively large. There are no scoring zones. You just have to get two hits on it. The potentially tricky part is 
there's no feedback. So you can't really see your hits on the target. You have to get a total of 24 hits. So two positions times, or two shots times four positions times three repetitions. And any, any overs or unders are penalties. And the penalty is 60 seconds. So you have to make sure that you're confident and know your hits. Interestingly, for what it's worth, the way they scored these, uh, they didn't bother pasting targets, they actually just reset the target after each shooter uh, and then counted the hits. And I think for high volume uh, fire on paper like this, that really makes sense. It was a lot faster for the to, to reset the stage that way. Uh, and it uh, trying to paste 24 shots on target for every shooter would have taken a long time and you would have very quickly had a hard time distinguishing new hits. So here is my last set of pistol shots. And one more. There we go. And I'm all done. This was a good one. Um, I thought I did really poorly on this one. 164 seconds. I uh, did not think I was that close to parring out on it. And yet I ended up eighth overall. So be ha to me. That was, that was really, really cool. Um, this is the core of brutality matches. It's a heavily physical event. It's going to burn you out on cardio and shooting challenges all put together. So uh, next one, the vehicle ambush. This is a different sort of physical challenge. We start uh, draw and load your pistol and put a couple of hits on a relatively, well, a very small pistol target out there at about 50 yards. So I'll get to that eventually. And then grab a magazine off the tire of the truck and crawl under the truck. Come around and grab your rifle out of the back of the truck and then you have to make 10 shots on a paper target. So it's the same sort of thing. It's a high volume engagement. Uh, you have to have a specific number of hits on paper, so make sure that you make your hits. If you pull a shot, you're not going to be able to tell from this position unless you know your sights and your trigger pull well enough that you can that you know where all of your shots landed. Uh, then you're going to crawl back under the truck, make a couple more pistol hits, and retrieve a second magazine. The magazines on this stage were all, uh, well, they didn't have to be, but we all preloaded them to 10 to make sure that we didn't actually fire 11 rounds. The key here is how quickly can you transition back and forth. The truck was not as low to the ground as like the Sisu armored vehicle that we had at Finnish Brutality last year, but, uh, <laughs> but the range here is completely made of sharp rocks, so. Uh, it was definitely a somewhat painful experience crawling under. I made sure to have long sleeves and long pants, but I didn't have any additional extra knee or elbow pads because the idea here was to be low profile and you know, not look out of place. So, a few scrapes, a few bruises, but that's par for the course. Grab my last magazine, crawl under the truck one more time, and engage the rifle target. Time. A surprising number of people got penalties on this stage for uh, putting rounds into the no-shoot below the paper or just missing the paper altogether because they tried going too fast. And you can see there, I also did that. I had two penalties here, which dropped me to 45th place overall. So two shots went low, hit the no-shoots. That's a... Uh, oops. That's a bad And of course, clear the guns. Now, moving on to stage five. This was a really cool, interesting set of props. So uh, the range had a set of three lights on the ground, and every time they heard a gunshot, they're running kind of like shot timers, uh, the three light, one of the three lights would come on and the others would turn off. And the idea here was there's a single hanging steel plate in that window. You can see it swinging back and forth there and you have to engage it 24 times. You have to make 24 hits on it, uh, and you make a hit from one position. Sometimes they're harder. The uh, the white, sort of a white tag board there, blocking part of the window, that is considered no shoot. So you hit that, it's a 60 second penalty. Once you make a shot, make a hit, you look down, find the light that is on, and make your next shot from that position. So you can see me trying to check. Uh, once I make a hit, now, which which light am I going to? There we go, all the way back. It kind of felt on this stage like I never used the middle position. Okay, well, there's one. It felt like I was never using the middle, that I was constantly going from one far end to the other far end. 
Um, the Arx Delta was a, a good gun for me here. This was not my best pistol shooting, actually not my best pistol shooting match in general. Uh, 24 hits uh, basically guarantees that you have to reload. There were a few people who had extended magazines that they used, but for anyone with a sort of a typical 15 to 19 round uh, magazine, you're going to have to reload. The RX Delta has 19 rounders. Um, they have a standard 17 and then a plus two base plate that they put on mags to give you a total of 19. So, this was a challenging one. It was it was a fun stage. None of the shots are impossible to make, and I don't think very many people timed out on this one. I certainly didn't. This was a challenge of how fast can you make the hits and move and reacquire yourselves. So the, the light system was a really cool way to do this. I'm excited to, to see if that system becomes a little more prevalent at other matches. It's a fun way to randomize. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to randomize. You can have people draw cards, but the, the light system here was pretty cool. So we're approaching the end of this stage. I've got just a couple more. There we go. Last shot there. So again, uh, I did it with plenty of time to spare, but not the greatest position. So 58th place overall. All right, that is five stages done. That's half the match. We did it all in the morning of the first day. We're going to come back tomorrow morning to do the second half. It's time for me to have a beer and enjoy the expo that Polinar has set up here. There's a whole bunch of uh, equipment, gun, tactical gear, all sorts of cool manufacturers, food truck. Like, it's a really good way, a really awesome uh, exhibition to have as part of the match. So I'm going to check that out for the afternoon. Uh, tune back in tomorrow and we'll have the second day of stages, 6 through 10, and we'll see how I did overall. So cheers. <laughs>